Hi guys, welcome to the live stream. We apologize. We had some sound checks we had to do. I'm really, really sorry. Um, I'm not going to blame anyone other than me. So I really apologize to all our viewers. Um, five, six minutes. It's okay, right? It's okay. I mean, not for Dutch standards, but world standards. It's okay, right, guys? Um, Kabir, welcome, bro. Sahbi, welcome. And Luke, a new face on the channel. Welcome, bro. Thank you for having me. I do watch this a lot, so it's a good privilege to be on here with you guys. Well, without further ado, please explain to us how you became an Ajax fan. I see you're prop, prop, <laughs> yeah, you're prepping the shirt already. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tell us. Um, so, so uh, it's probably about 1997 or 98. I got a uh, Champions League game for the PlayStation One, um, and I didn't know how to change the team, so I said to <laughs> Ajax every time. And he began with A, so then that's how I knew about Ajax. But the Eredivisie is obviously quite limited in this country at times. So I was never exposed. Um, coming from my background, we didn't have Sky Sports and stuff until I was a bit older. Uh, so um, I only really knew of them online. You check the BBC scores on BBC for like the English games and you'd find out on the Sky Sports website and things like that because I had a basic computer. But yeah, I knew about Ajax from a game because I couldn't change the team. So there we go. That's how it started. That's really funny, actually. But apart from that, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Because if I recall correctly, uh, you're also like a coach, assistant. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're I, doing some football stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So I am a, a level two coach. I'm looking to do my B license. So it goes um, UA for C is like level two. They've renamed it. It goes UA for B, UA for A, UA for Pro. And UA for Pro, you can manage a, a football club, professional club. Um, but it's a long, long journey with lots of in, ins and outs. Um, so I coach youth age groups. So I do under 11s mainly, and I do just below the academy at Reading Football Club Community Trust. So um, underneath, I will coach players in the elite, and then they'll offer trials for the academy. And that's as far as I go. I do in, in, things in and out of schools. Sometimes, you know, you do the community side of it. You go and help less fortunate children, let's say it that way, as nice as I could put it, maybe. Um, and then you put on up school things for them to have fun, play some football, get involved, because some players some players that are kids don't really get an opportunity to play for teams outside or can't afford it. Yeah. So sometimes we put on a thing at lunchtime for them or after school where they can come and enjoy and play football with their friends. Um, but I mainly coach the, the uh, young players at Reading. So. Awesome. So, okay, so I have to ask this question, right, before we yeah. jump into the Ajax uh, stuff. So you're doing your coach, coaching, licensing, all these kind of things. When you watch mm -hmm. football matches, and maybe Ajax in particular, are you watching it from a coach perspective or from a fan perspective, or maybe both? Yeah, so one thing that I've, I've learned about myself is that I used to watch it purely about winning. I, when I started coaching, everything was about winning. Now I watch Man City games to see if they change anything of their style. Ajax is a bit different because there's a bit more emotion involved. I just want to win the game. Uh, I want it to look good. I just want to win. But other games, when I watch them, I watch them purely out of can I learn something from it? Or because I enjoy problem solving in a sense. And if you've got a really narrow defense, say, um, and then you your team opens up the wings and there's more space in the middle, kind of thing, how can you then get past the defensive line? It's, it's problem solving for me in some own head. Like, how, what would I do in that situation? And, you know, that's, that's what I enjoy doing. But I act purely in motion, always want to win, can't have anything left. So. All right. Well, it's perfect to have you because we're going to talk about probably the coach that might come to Ajax and maybe also about other coaches. So it's good to have a fresh perspective as well. Um, Sahbi, all good, man. Did you did you did you have a good vacation, man? People were asking for you, man. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Fully energized, ready for the next season. Uh, I needed it, man. I needed the holiday. It was it was mainly because of Ajax. I I. I uh, I I I, I uh, put in a uh, early holiday because it was yeah the, the stress was immense uh, but now fully energized man so let's do it let's go all right. all right Kabir you're in Dubai man what's the temperature like right now <laughs> it's about to reach close to fifty degrees next week <sighs> that's crazy bro <laughs> damn that's man crazy. yeah man yeah, so <laughs> nice well conditioned room. Uh, you're hydrated. Do you have your drinks with you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the drinks that I drink, we're not, won't we're not insured. We cannot, <laughs> we cannot. You know, if something happens to you, we cannot pay for it. So please. No, I don't, man. Right? No, no, no. I've not, I've not gotten anywhere. I just had a nice big gulp of water before I jumped on. So we're all good, man. Good, good. All right. <laughs> enough, 
enough of the intros. Uh, by the way, quickly, I'm reading all the viewers' uh, comments. Uh, welcome, everyone. Sorry that we were late. Any questions you have, any comments you have, bring them up. Uh, I will present it to the panels as much as possible. Um, some people are already impressed by your intro, uh, Luke. So maybe 2030, you become the new Ajax coach. <laughs> hey, uh, my dream is to is to be able to go to the Netherlands and coach up there. I think the football development system is so much better. The UK is not for me. They feel like they're 30 years behind. They always have been behind Spain and Netherlands. Cruyff going over to Barca, total football kind of thing. Um, but the development, because really the money in the Eredivisie is not as big as the Premier League, they have to use their own youth. And I just I just prefer that kind of, that kind of method. So, okay, perfect. All right, guys, um, let's start with a small talk a little bit before we jump into the Norwegian coach. Um, some news came out today. I will start with the Berghuis uh, news. So we knew what happened after. For, I mean, everybody knew what happened. Uh, there were some slurs, insults, also racist remarks towards Broby. Uh, that's the news that we heard, and he overheard, <clears throat> and he wanted to hit the fan. We don't know if he hit him, yes or no, but today the Dutch, the National Dutch uh, Football Association said that he will be suspended for uh, at least two games. Well, one is conditional, so two games. They can appeal for it, theoretically still, I believe, but it seems like it's going to be two games. Um, what was your initial reaction about that? And um, do you? It, it's a hard one, it's a tough one, because a lot of people were say like, you know, racial, racist is not, there's no room for racist in football, right? And racial slurs, all these kind of things. But he did attack a fan as well. So where do you stand on this? Let me give it to Luke first. Uh, so it's quite a difficult thing because you obviously don't want to condone any kind of violence, right? But at the same time, being someone of an ethnic origin, I know what it's like to uh, receive some kind of racial slurs at some point in my life. Um, so I can understand the emotion behind it. But sometimes when you're a professional and you have this platform and you have this kind of following, Sometimes it's leading by example a little bit. It's, it's a difficult thing because I want to defend it because I absolutely, I, if it was my friend, someone I'm close to, I would react angrily at the same time. But at the same time, when there's people watching and it's in front of lots of fans, it's a bit like, could maybe could you have done something differently? But it's, 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 it's a 50-50 double-edged sword kind of thing, isn't it? So. Yeah. Safi, what do you think? What do I think? I think Berha should deserve a medal. <laughs> not, and not being suspended. I mean... Come on, man. Somebody being so open on racism, trying to uh, say something. I won't say the word, but doing to a fellow friend, colleague. Of course, you don't you don't uh, condemn um, uh, racism or, 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 or hitting somebody and so on. But come on, man. The, the Dutch Association should should at least think about the story behind why he did it. And... Uh, maybe a warning should uh, uh, should have come up, or or maybe you, you, uh, you should there should be something. But I, I would definitely not suspend him. I mean, it's such uh, such bullshit. He he came up for his uh, he stood up for for his friend for his colleague based on something that everybody is against. And yeah, the thing it is, happens the... too much. It happens too much. Yeah, and, that's and, true. And and, and 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 the authorities are doing shit about it the, the 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 football association is doing shit about it so at the end what would you what would you recommend to do about it uh zombie if it was up to you what would you do to prohibit or prevent these things from happening again yeah it, it's difficult to say but the the punishment needs to be way more harsh for the one who's committing the racism and not the other way around yeah but that one is hard also to uh you know like to Everything is hard. I think I think that's the that's the thing, you know. Um, when we see when we saw the videos, I don't know if there there are more videos out there, but the ones that we saw, it's clear that he was the one that threw a punch. Everything else we didn't. It's only hearsay. So maybe that yeah, exactly. would be, that would have been also maybe something why they gave him a two match. You know, no, like but there were witnesses, right? I mean, that was also clear afterwards. Yeah. Uh, so they probably want to send a message, but in my view, it's a wrong message. Okay, so Ajax is in the house as well. So uh, you're speaking facts according to him. That's good. Um, Kabir, bro, what's your opinion about this? It's a hard one, yeah. I know. It's, it's a tricky one, of course, isn't it? Yeah. I think everyone will have their own opinions on it. Um, look, obviously, you know, there is a massive issue within the game. 
and I think just within the wider community with regards to racism. Um, and obviously it cannot be condoned uh, at all in any way, shape or form. But I do also understand and appreciate that as a footballer, as a person of you know interest in the public eye, et cetera, et cetera, you do have a, a role model sort of function and standing within society. Because see, the thing is at the end of the day, if a child's watching that, um, and then, you know, he goes to school or he goes to work or, or you know, a person goes to work and, and someone says something and they beat them up. You're like, well, you know, my favorite footballer does the same. So then you're you're almost escalating an issue when actually probably there are more. Well, there are effective ways to go around it. Um, we just haven't found the solution, um, you know, in, in our community across the world. Um, mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in Spain. You know, I'm sure uh, Vinicius Jr. wished that he could punch every single person in that stadium. But, you know, there are probably different ways you can go about it. Uh, I, I also think that it was probably a buildup of all the frustration from the season. And it was the last game of the season. We lost 3-1 away in very typical Ajax fashion. Uh, and he just wanted to let out all that steam. Um, and it was probably a culmination and buildup of all this stuff. But, no, of course, he shouldn't be acting like that. But at the same time, obviously, there's no place for racism. Yeah. All right. Um, I think I think we covered this pretty well. Um, another news I want to go and uh, talk about, guys, today as well is uh, the news that was brought by uh, Menno Gehlen not um, wanting to succeed Van der Sar as the next general manager or CEO, and one actually the main reason for that being that he wants somebody to um, come in who has been an Ajax legend, former Ajax player that has some kind you know, of role as a figurehead for Ajax to the outside world, which Cruyff always advocated for. Um, it, for me, it's like, like it sounds so logic like that I'm impressed by it, but we know Menno Gele has done incredible work on the commercial side of things for Ajax. So he might be also qualified to do a very good job as a CEO. Um, so do you guys agree with his you know with this although he might be a very suitable and very good candidate Kabir what do you think yeah I think so I think look he's been in the uh in the board you know um for a very long time now he's obviously doing a great job I think he gets it so I think that he probably understands that you know there's also an element of with a club like Ajax there always is you know clamor for the Ajax DNA for ex-professionals to come in and assume these roles so he also knows that tomorrow if he accepts this position and things don't go well six months down the line, he's out of a job because he's going to be attacked for the fact that he doesn't have an Ajax background. So maybe he's playing it safe as well. And he's also, by putting out a statement like this, he's won the hearts of pretty much every Ajax fan, right? So he's playing it safe, but also securing his position at the same time. And I think he's doing a great job. He's in a very good job. He's, he's doing obviously great work. He's good at what he does. So why take that risk? He's probably learned a little bit from Johnny Heitinger. Why take that risk, you know, when you're on a certain trajectory, when someone else can come in that would be better suited or qualified? That's yeah, what I think. Absolutely. absolutely. Luke, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because football is moving in such a quick and, and modern way where it's becoming less about uh, loyalty and, and and football itself, and it's coming about business and how much revenue can can you make to to run. And unfortunately, yeah. it's becoming a situation where the area of visa, you win it, you get six million, okay, and then you get most of your money from qualifying for the Champions League, which Ajax doesn't have going into next season. So then you lose a bit of money. So then maybe you need to take the steps that everyone else is taking, and and you know having someone who hasn't got the Ajax DNA. Um, to bring in better money or to handle things a bit, a little differently to make the best of what is a bad situation currently at the club um, and start afresh. But at the same time, I'm very much someone with morals as well. And I do, the reason why a lot of people are attracted to Ajax for me is because of the history and because of the Ajax DNA, they do things the Ajax way. Um, so, you know, for me, I think you'd have to go the new route and 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 pick up business, the business end of it. And build and uh, bring more revenue, not just from um, from player sales, which seems to be a majority of it with Champions League football, but also you know uh, shirt sales. You know, making Ajax, uh, even though they are like a worldwide brand to a lot of people, especially in the UK, but more everywhere. You see, when there's tours in Japan from the likes of the Premier League teams, Arsenal, Chelsea, they go to Japan, they sell shirts crazy, and then they go to like Thailand and you know doing the same thing and making it a bit more of a brand. Um, 
yeah, it's, sometimes business is taken over football slowly. You see the, the Saudi Arabia things as well. Money just speaks volumes for every single thing now. And I feel like slowly, Ajax is slowly losing that grip of the Cruyff and the era and, and, and the, you know, the Ajax way, unfortunately, in football yep. in general we'll, as well. We'll touch more about the Ajax DNA and what you're just pointing out to. It's very interesting. Uh, Sabi, um, your view on the next CEO, Ajax legend, prodigy, a uh, former Ajax player. You, do you agree with the whole narrative, the, the what Cruyff advocated for, or are you more like, let's be more pragmatic about this, these kind of things. The best one deserves to be at that position. What do you think? No, no, I definitely agree with uh, what, with the plan Cruyff. Uh, there should always be a football person within the board, just like you see at Bayern Munich. Um, and it, it's going well. I mean, you need to have somebody who, ha who can guard... The, the, the culture of Ajax from a football perspective and not only being someone who's able or who's suitable to be in, active in a board. So, yeah, I, and, and that's why I loved what Menno Gehle uh, did. He won the heart, just like Kabir said, but he's also doing an excellent job at his current position, bringing in big sponsors, uh, um, um, having connections with different big associations, like the UEFA and, and, and the uh, Dutch Football Association. So he can be used by the new CEO in different manners. But I, what I love the most about him and also the fans is he's acting like a normal person. He's mingling with the fans. He's active, interacting with the fans. He's going to the pubs with the fans. So he's a plain person doing a great job for Ajax. And he supports the plan cry. So who am I to say he's he's doing a terrible job? I think he's he, he, he's doing an excellent job. All right. Um, I was thinking, right, about what you're just saying about Menuhele doing an excellent job. The only I apologize, it's very tricky to say this on an open channel like this, but I think he could do a better job on the on the shirts going forward. You know, it's it hasn't been the yeah, best but... shirts, what we've seen previous season and going into next season, it could be better, you know. But on the other hand, you know, when you when you bring out a Bob Marley shirt like that, nothing can top yeah. that, right? So yeah, well, um, we'll just have yeah. to wait what, what his mandate is eh, with regards to the shirts. Maybe That's it's true. Adidas. Maybe it's Adidas who has yeah. the mandate to choose their own design. Eh? So That's I don't true. know. That's true. Um, all right, uh, so some questions coming in, um, which one of them we're definitely going to touch upon uh, regarding um, the Knutze rumors and how the Dutch media landscape is reacting to that. But before we do, let's talk about Knutze. Guys, um, it seems more and more like he's in pole position, although there's very little being uh, leaked to the press and we're not hearing a lot. But it seems like he's in pole position. He's one of the candidates for sure. Uh, we know now that Boss is close to um, going to PSV, actually. Uh, it's only a matter of maybe today, tomorrow. They're close on signing him. So um, <coughs> my question to Luke, um, from a coach perspective as well, maybe. Um, what do you think of this appointment, you know, going for a foreign coach, Norwegian coach, obviously successful at Bodo Glimt? Um, are you surprised by it? Do you think it's a good idea? Do you know anything about the coach, how he likes to play? Um, can you share it with us as well? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I can't say I've watched every single game of every single game uh, season and, and in Norway. Um, mm -hmm. But I have watched Europa League games, they beat Roma 6-1. Um, and I've watched highlights here and there on YouTube. I did a bit of research myself. Um, he's a very, uh, he's like Bosch. And he's also, you know, like De Zerbi at Brighton. Um, Okay, he likes playing really forward, forward football. He likes to be dominant on the ball and he likes to have people receiving in between the lines, uh, between between midfielders, receive it, take a whole line of midfield out to turn and play against the defenders. And he likes runners. Um, I looked at some of the average positions of some of his players for the like They've only played 10 games in, in, in the league this season. They've won nine and drawn one. Um, and the average positions are that the, some games he has his fullbacks really, really high and he has his wingers come inside, almost like strikers. Um, and his midfielders, midfielders are sit, but then at the same time, other games, his one left back might be sit back while one wing is wide and the other one's inside and the midfielder's higher. And it seems like he, he likes to 
tinker and move players depending on what's happening in, in the result. I mean, he's won nine out uh, ten, uh, nine out of ten, sorry, and drawn one. So um, it's not like. Does he, he, does he question? Does he uh, play the same way domestically from what you have seen as going into Europe, or does he make uh, changes to, that, to his? Uh... No, no, no. It, it, it looks it, from what I've seen, it looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, I haven't seen all of them. However, he likes his team to be dominant and playing one twos and receiving the lines. Like what we've seen prior, he likes having one midfielder a little bit deeper sometimes, like Gravenberg uh, did with uh, Berghaus when he was a little bit as more of a ten uh, when they played PSV in in the in the Becker final a couple of years back. Um, and he, he likes to do that. But he likes to dominate on the ball. And what's quite interesting actually is that he uh, prioritizes uh, psychology within the team. Um, he actually hired, uh, uh, I think it's a Norwegian. Uh, former Air Force pilot or somebody who worked in the Air Force to come and handle the psychology or do psychology session, sessions with the players um, because he said he, he valued, obviously, it's quite tiring. You go away and you go, because their season's from April to December. Yeah. So they go and they have, before pre-season happens, they might be playing in the quarterfinal of the Europa League and they played Roma and they're playing Celtic and beat Celtic without any match fitness. So psychology is a huge thing to be psychologically fit for a game, even physically you might not be. That psychology might get you that 10 yards further, might get you be able to get through a draw into a win for the next leg and stuff. Um, but it, from what I've seen, it does look like it's, it's consistent throughout. But like I said, I can't watch every single game. So, uh, Do you think he's a good fit for Ajax? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, with Ajax is you always, like we talk about the identity of Ajax and, and the Clive way of, of doing things. And you always want Ajax to be dominant on the ball, especially considering they're, for us, the, top, the best team in, in the Eredivisie in the Netherlands, you know, because we'll always say that. But um, you always want to be dominant true. because with Ajax, it is true. And we want to be dominant. You always want to be on the ball. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, the thing that might go against us is we might not have the players to do so straight away. So it may take a bit of time. You know, Cam Bassi, for example, if he plays at the back, would he be able to play out? And play with the ball and be confident on the ball because sometimes he looks like he's lacking in that area as some other players you know yeah absolutely um sahbi your uh, your views man um i remember last year we were also at this position like looking or searching for a new coach what was your top three again just remind us again what was your top three <laughs> at that time oh then man i need to think uh, back again uh i know i had jung as number three uh-huh uh slot and um, Gallardo as number one. Okay, all right. All yeah. Right. Who was the, who was who was the person again? Is he still in the chat that had Schroeder <laughs> in the stock tree? Okay. He's not in the chat again. Oh, the, is the, Adi, Adi here? Maybe he can he can wave at us for for a bit. Anyways, whisperer. Uh, <laughs> on a serious note, sorry for that. Uh, on a serious note, uh, Sahbi, um, your opinion about Knutsen? Um, you know, there's a lot of negative criticism coming from some of the journalists, you know, pundits, etc. Um, but from your perspective first, before we go into that narrative. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I saw a couple of games as well um, and, and uh, uh, big summaries and I was quite enthusiastic from what I, for what I'm seeing. It's, it's, it's a bit of the way uh, uh, Boss plays or played uh, at Ajax, a little bit of high uh, gegenpressing, pressing, like forward pressing what they do, a lot of combinations. They try to disrupt their uh, their defense or their uh, uh, defensive midfield, and that's something that we also saw with uh, with uh, with Boss. Um, but also like uh, uh, very uh, the, the wingers going deep, so fast wingers who are going deep. That's something that we don't see currently with with Schroeder or the Hadija ball, having Tadic on the left side uh, and so on. But they really have wingers who go deep and the, and and they're wing backs or the full backs uh, uh, coming forward as well just like uh, Luke said so it's it, it was it was really uh, nice football to see attacking dominant uh, I saw also some European games also against PSV and it was it, it was good to watch it was fun to watch and uh, that's what I like about Ajax Ajax stands for attacking football dominant football attractive football and that's what I like to see and that's what I've seen and so I'm I'm I, and I'm and I'm I have full trust in missing that. So from that perspective, I'm all I'm all for uh, uh, for Kruitz at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Kabir, I have an impression that you're not that positive about Knutsen, but 
please elaborate. <laughs> no, I know because obviously in our group chat, <laughs> I put my thoughts down in the group chat about uh, Knutsen. But no, look, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm willing to be uh, surprised, you know, positively. I think it is the IX way, isn't it, really? Um, you know, give people the chance. Uh, this will obviously be his first big role, you know, in Europe. Uh, no disrespect to his current club in the Norwegian league, but this would be a step up. We might have Norwegian fans, so please don't don't disrespect anyone. <laughs> yeah, no disrespect. I mean, I did reach out, as I mentioned, I've got a couple of uh, football mad Norwegian friends. I reached out to them for advice um, or their thoughts, and they yeah, they were very positive. Um, like you guys mentioned, you know, plays the game in the right way, or at least the Ajax way. Uh, very dynamic, um, fits within the principles of what the club would look for. So from that regard, absolutely, why not, you know, give someone the chance? I just think that, you know, there is a little bit of me that feels that as Ajax, um, you know, we could probably maybe aim for a more established, uh, reputable name, just because I feel like with the season that we've had, regardless of what Knutsen has done at his current club or previously in his career, this will still be a gamble of some sort. And I just don't know whether... Yeah having gambled on Schroeder and then Heitinger and it didn't work out, you know, for it to then, you know, three times in a row, if we made, you know, three bad hires or if we have a terrible start to the season, it's, you know, I don't know. But then, of course, I also understand the idea that there's no guarantee that a big name will get it right as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because I wanted to ask you quickly, what do you consider a gamble when hiring a coach? Is it pure only experience? Yeah, I think experience. I think the... Uh, you know, lack of experience, actually, so to speak, of having managed in a uh, or managed a big club where there's expectation. I think where he's taken his current club, they were playing second tier Norwegian football and he brought them up. So it was a success story. He could do no wrong, really. But when you're coming into a club like Ajax with all that expectation, all that history attached to it, especially on the back of a bad season, you kind of have to hit the ground running. I mean, you look at people like Peter Bos, he had a pretty bad start to his career and we were all jumping on his back. Eric Ten Hag had a bad start to his career. We were all jumping on his back. So he's going to get that. Um, but I think, you know, with guys like Boston, you know, they're, they're Dutch and people had seen the way their teams played previously. So they had an understanding. Okay, look what Eric Ten Hag did with Utrecht. Uh, you know, Peter Bos got also his teams in Holland playing in a certain way. So you had that, you know, understanding. There was a, a credit there that, you know, you could afford. But I, I, I don't see that with this guy. Uh, and so that's what I'm worried about. But Kabir, uh, just from my understanding, who do you consider? What do you consider an established coach? Because, and well, is it realistic? Because uh, I heard fans talking about Nagelsmann, uh, Luis Enrique, uh, Potter, um, uh, Zidane, and, and so on. I mean, those are, so to say, established coaches with a huge salary. Uh, Pochettino came in as well. Who was, who was on his way? He went to Chelsea. But what do you consider an established coach uh, well, from I mean, Ike's perspective and from your perspective? Yeah. Those names are obviously great, but you know, sense of realism. You know, they wouldn't come to a league which wouldn't pay them that much, or a club that wouldn't pay them much. But someone like an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, for instance, he's Scandinavian. You know, he started his career off there managing, but he also managed United, and it worked out initially. It didn't work out in the end, and. I don't know what he's doing now. I think he might be unemployed. But why not someone like that? Because that's less of a gamble. He's worked with big players. He's worked in a big change room. He's managed a club where there is expectation. And this um, would be the perfect mm, kind of setup for him to use. Yeah, interesting name. Just quickly, sorry, Kabir. Um, so I'm, uh, I, just, I, would, I was just thinking you know, about the interview that they had with uh, Sven, uh, the day that they announced that Heitinger will not continue as a head coach. And of course, a lot of journalistic, uh, journalists asking questions. One of the questions being what type or what the profile would be of the new coach. And he said, well, the new coach should have uh, a display of attractive attacking football, should be able to have an eye on the youth, developing players from the academy, and <clears throat> have overachieved in his previous clubs, at his previous clubs. I don't think uh, Solskjaer basically you know it's, like it's that narrative yeah fits those criteria so um i understand from an established perspective but it he's not that profile type of coach that sven is looking for he's not that profile kind of coach but that obviously you know i disagree a little bit with the type of profile coach that we're looking to get uh, which one that one. which which one exactly well i think i think obviously the attractive football side of things as well of course and and 
you know, I think he's aiming more for an individual that's, um, like you said, maybe unproven in the big world, but, you know, come to Ajax, we'll give him a chance and then we'll have, you know, developed the next big manager. And I think that's great because that falls in line with the club philosophy around developing people from scratch and building them up and then them moving on. But I just think that's fine to do if, you know, we've had three or four glory years under Eric Ten Hag and he's left and then you get someone else. But when we've had a terrible year, I just feel that maybe, you know, the, the lack of experience of the pressure situation of managing Ajax could okay. ultimately prove to be an issue. And I, I hope I'm proven wrong. Yeah. I, hope I'm proven, I hope this guy comes on board and he does amazingly. And I'll be the first yeah. to admit it. But I'm just a worried after a bad season. Do you, does anyone want to go through a phase again where in six months' time we're <clears> getting rid of this guy? But no, I sorry. Mean, nobody, nobody. I'll go ahead, Luke. Sorry, man. So there, there's a good point that you made was the, the bad season, but would an Enrique want to come to a team, for example, where they can't guarantee a big transfer budget and they can't guarantee a wage budget? You're losing Edson Alvarez. You're losing uh, Urien Simba, for example. Maybe Kudus as well. Um you know, and then come in and then not like look at Antonio Conte at, at Tottenham. He goes in, uh, you know, you can have this money, have that money. He wants to come in. These managers come in for a ready made team to win straight away. They want to be guaranteed signings and things like that. Schroeder came in and was said you'd only lose what one player, two players, end up losing Anthony. It, and this is a story he told, but um, you know, maybe these these managers, maybe sorry, maybe Sven's not uh targeting these kind of managers because you know these managers want a ready-made uh, meal to eat, essentially, rather than someone like Knudsen who would go and make the meal and, and make it into into his his gourmet five-star meal that everyone's going to have a slice of, you know? So um, maybe he's winning for the challenge and he's obviously proven that, you know, he's won the league in Norway and, you know, and like you said, Ajax is a place where people come and wrongly or rightly, you come and, and, and it's a step, stepping stone according to Sanchez, but um, you know, you come in and you prove yourself, uh, and maybe the big managers can't be attracted because you can't guarantee those kind of things that they want to, to be successful straight away. Because some yeah, players, some managers yeah, rely yeah. on that. Yeah, absolutely. And to add to what you're saying, Luke, it's also I read somewhere. I don't know if it's true, of course, but I read that um, there were talks with Boss from Ajax perspective. But Boss is demanding quite a lot, you know, in terms of what he wants. He's very specific what he wants to happen with the team, he wants a budget available, et cetera, et cetera, that that might have been a little bit overstretching at Ajax. I don't know if it's true or not, but it fits into the, you know, a new coach coming in, new ideas, fresh ideas, et cetera. And maybe Sven is looking at, you know, after the year we've had, it's very smart of him of saying, we're looking for a coach that has overachieved as previous clubs because we need somebody to take us out of the slump. Right. Exactly. Exactly. He has to work his magic in a very relatively short time. Yeah. And 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 what I do like about Knutze, he reminds me a bit about Tenach, uh, in terms of professionalism. He is. He sounds really super professional with regards to his team. He doesn't leave anything to chance. Just like Tenach, yeah. he never uh, uh, left anything to chance. He wanted to have everything fixed. And if you look at the team of Knutze. Where he has a mental coach, just uh, just like uh, Lucas said, and several uh, people assisting him in the things that he wants to see and wants to achieve. It it says something about the person himself that he wants to deliver. He wants to to take uh, 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 the most out everybody. It reminds me of Tanakh, and that is super bullish for me. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, look, you, just yeah, go ahead. Ahead. Like go I said, ahead. I mean, if we have this chat in six months' time to a year's time and I'm proven wrong, I'll be the first to be happily proven wrong. Okay. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Um, before we jump to, to the next talking point, I just want to go over the comments, uh, give our viewers, of course, a chance also to have their points uh, shown. Uh, so BRM uh, has a few points on Knudsen. Um, so Knudsen got different ways of build-up, though. Uh, which is interesting, and he also elaborates a little bit more. When an opponent sits deep, he tends to use his fullbacks on the inside, close to the center backs, wingers hugging the touchline, and the six connecting the triangles in a very unique way. That that sounds really interesting yeah. indeed. Uh, Rita is saying uh, regarding when we talked about Menno Helen, uh, why don't go for 
Jordi Cruyff, you know, which is an interesting name um, and makes as sense a, from that perspective, you know. As a coach, you mean? No, no, no. As, uh, as a CEO. CEO. CEO yeah. 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 Nah. But I heard something very interesting, actually, about Jordi Cruyff, that, okay. yes, there's obviously he's the son of, but in terms of his, you know, he doesn't, he hasn't really had much to do with the club, apart from playing a little bit, and he's very much sort of, you know, based in Spain, and I think, you know, he, he's looking after his elderly mother in Spain, and, like, he's not attached to the Netherlands, okay. as you would think he would be, you know, like, you'd think obvious choice, you know, Jordi Cruyff, but I don't think there is that connection. He's, he He's more connected to Barcelona. Uh, yeah, than, than yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I which, agree. which, if you think about his, uh, you know, history, his career, everything yeah, makes yeah. sense. It makes sense as well, to be honest. Juan, Juan, can I ask uh, uh, to the viewers, the Norwegian viewers, how Knuts is handling the transition uh, uh, part of his style of football? Because the way he plays, the way he wants to play, is of course very risky. Do is there any risk of transition um, um, with his type of play, and how do they? How does he cope with that? Maybe, maybe the the, the viewers know. Yeah, if there's anyone, yeah, if there's anyone uh, on the channel watching right now that wants to react to that, please do, and I will bring. Sorry, Tabby, just on that, two seconds before we move to the next point. Um, I think he, I think it is very, very risky. Um, I think anyone that plays that way is risky. Even Man yeah. City, you see Man City, it's always going to be susceptible to a long ball or a counter attack. Um, so I think if someone doesn't give you a proper answer, I think it would just tactically it would always just be the same for someone who's dominant. Centre halves are in the in the opponent's half, um, you know, and then it would always be susceptible to a, to a counter attack goal for whoever plays dominant football. So I think it's just going to be a, a case of maybe we like to see this dominant football and attacking football. Uh, maybe we have to, you know, we're going to concede the old goal every now and then, especially with the defenders we have right now anyway. So it's like a, you know, it's going to be like yeah. building blocks, you know what I mean? So, yeah. That's, that's more like, do we concede a lot? Do, does he concede a lot of goals? Does his team concede a lot of goals in transition? What I've seen, uh, I've only seen a few crosses, but like I said, I've only seen a handful of games and highlights. So yeah. the goals that he conceded, headers from across, a couple of counter-attacks. Uh, but he normally wins 3-1, 4-2. 5-1 sometimes, they drew, drew one game 2-2, so from what I've seen, it doesn't look like it. But I wouldn't be surprised if if, if they did concede more goals than you expect from counter-attacks and things because you're high press, you're going to okay. concede some kind of... No, no, of course. Game. I mean, I'd rather win with 5-2 or 5-3 than, than with 1-0, so I, I would rather mind. win. <laughs> I yeah. Yeah, win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either way, either way. Um, all right, going back to the comments quickly, uh, just so I go over them. Um, so, Kabir, I just not a fan, no so <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, also crying, uh, no terrible coach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, BRN saying, I love how Mr. Todd explained it, uh, you know, on the uh, finding the new coach, he probably wants to find a new club, which maybe Knudsen fits into that narrative. Yeah. Um, let me see. What else do we have here? Sorry, on that one about the yeah, club, I think it might be not necessarily the same playing style, but someone who's came and and built a team because Liverpool signed Andy Robertson from from Scot from Hull, I think, and then he came from Scotland. And and Andy Andy Robertson was like I don't know, like seven mil, and end up being one of the best left backs in in the world in the league, won the Champions League. And I think I think that's what he means. Not in, in case some people are watching this and thinking it's going to be the same kind of tactics if it wins it wins but i think it was more so personality can talk to the media can talk to lots of people very clear of what he wants and 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 will try and build up what we have and buy small players you know like six million and build them up to something knowing who he wants for his clear idea and i think that was a problem with heisinger is he obviously didn't know whether he was staying or not and also you didn't really see much of the identity with him did you like a clear style of, of a play so i think maybe that's what he means by playing a new club so so just just to make it bluntly clear, uh, and I want all three of you to react to that before I go back to the comments. Um, Heidegger came in, one of, the, one of the arguments to defend Heidegger, obviously, is he came as an interim, he stepped in, and he had to deal with the players that we had. He didn't have any say in whatsoever in any of the players. Like, if you guys firmly believe if that would have been Knudsen, theoretically, hypothetically, he would have gotten more out of the team in those six months. 
Uh, for me, it's, it's difficult because mm. it takes time for players to gel, um, even, you know, under a new coach, uh, a new voice. I don't know if you've ever heard of the new manager bounce, but you, you get a new manager in, everyone starts playing really, really well, but it's only because it's a new environment in a sense. Someone may have changed a time, they've changed, they might train at 8am rather than 7am, I don't know. But I think that um, if you look at it from, from a perspective of Heidegger, he did what he could, absolutely, and I absolutely appreciate everything he did for the club, stepping in in, in a horrible time. But I did not see anything change, even even, even the slightest. I mean, Brobby ended up playing really, really, really well towards the end. Uh, maybe not his finishing. His hold-up play was really outstanding. And he managed to last 90 minutes and, and got further. And maybe the players are more attached to him because of how they, they probably see him as as maybe like a mentor and as a as an uncle or, or a best friend or something like that, where they're able to feel more comfortable in training, where maybe Schroeder didn't. Um, so maybe there's that end of it, but I feel like it's difficult to to say whether Canucksen would have done anything in six months because you have to get used to a different style of play. And I think maybe Heidsinger didn't implement one because he just tried to get him out of the hole. Maybe um, I'm, I'm I'm not so sure, but I don't I don't I don't believe Knutson maybe six months maybe even too soon for him to really get any better than Heidsinger. Maybe I'm not so sure. Okay, all right. Can I go back to the comments, guys, or yeah. does somebody want to react uh, still? No. Go ahead, right. quickly. Um, uh, it's just me, Rhea. Thank you. Every, evening, everyone. Evening back to you. Big up, Luke. Sounding great. You know, you have fans already, Luke. Um, <laughs> no way. Okay, so Kabir, you're getting that one smashed again on your face. Sorry for that. <laughs> no. I, I said someone like a Solskjaer, by the way, but okay. No, okay. You were making a point. I understand. No way Solskjaer committed crimes uh, at United. No discipline. He didn't even train the players. So that's, <laughs> that's where you get Eitinger as the assistant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, please, no Solskjaer. I think I think that one really infuriated some of the some of the viewers, bro. Um, no, only at the wheel. We can't at, least we know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least we know what we're getting. Um, shite but no at least no surprises so that's uh that's great <laughs> um let's see what else do we have um dinos most important thing is that we get a coach that is on the up like ten Hag was if that's Knuts, if that Knutson guy did a good job let's give him a shot it's a good point though uh i like i like that narrative uh that argumentation as well uh roy from what i've seen i've been watching quite a few games Knudsen's style, win the ball as quickly as possible, press the opponents to their half, and make the field as wide as possible. Does that fit into what you guys saw as well? Luke? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He was very, very high pressing, tried to force mistakes, win the ball. And then uh, one thing I noticed as well is when they win the ball, they just want bodies in the box. Just get just get lots of bodies forward. So you have two, three, because I, I know that he likes to have, I've seen that he likes to have two or three passing options to a player. A lot of supporting roles. As soon as you win the ball really high, get people forward. So you've got two or three forward passing options so you can get an opportunity. That's why I've seen so. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> Roy, adding to that, Knudsen prefers using young, talented players. What I found interesting is that he plays 4-1-4-1 when his team has trouble keeping the press going, when he's getting pressed back. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait. It's at least a plan B. It's there's, a somebody, there's somebody... That likes Kabir. We like him too, by the way. Um, to Kabir's defense, Solskjaer was also the best coach in Norway when he was there, just like Knudsen is now. So, all right. And he managed Fair the big enough. club afterwards. Fair and enough. this one I was not even supposed to bring up. So, we're not going to react to that, but we're not, just going to. Bro, know. Mike. No. I have no, some Mike. No, Mike. You. No, Mike. Um, Guys, I'm going to be honest, right? Um, here comes the emotional Juan right now, which I don't display a lot on the channel. But I have a bit of problems, to be honest, to accept the fact that Boss is going to coach PSV next oh, season. Man. Don't get me started, bro. Yeah, because, you know, I will explain why. And maybe you guys see it totally different than, than I do, right? For me, that one year, uh, maybe I'm making it like romanticizing it a little bit. But that was... An, uh, even though we didn't win anything, I, I know how I felt. I still remember how I felt when the season was done. Even though we lost the final of the Europa League, I was very proud of that team. I was really like blown away that this team was able to reach Europa League final and also the way we did it. It's not like, of course, we had luck here and there. I will not, you know, dispute that. <clears throat> but looking at the way we played, you know, the attacking football, that that crazy maybe attacking football even, 
it just gave you energy, like a spectator, like an Ajax fan. It just, you know, like, and don't forget, it was the youngest team to be to feature in the European uh, final also. <clears throat> and only in one year, coming from, you know, the Frank de Boer football, no disrespect, but at the end, it was like, basically, how they, how they say, how do you say baton football in, uh, in English, uh, Kabir? Maybe you can help me with that. Like concrete football? <laughs> yeah, but what does it mean? <laughs> like, basically, <laughs> like, they would get... Very rigid style of play. Very oh, so structured, very square. Back, yeah. yeah, a lot of back passes, a lot of yeah, back, yeah. Uh, passes In back to the keeper. Like, like, it was horrible to watch. Yeah. You know? so, um, so coming back, I just think, you know, it. even though he's he's not, he doesn't have a history at Ajax, I do understand that as well, you know. Um, it's just hard, you know, that he goes there. Like, you know, I don't, I don't like seeing him succeed at PSV. It just doesn't sit well with me. How do you guys view that? Let me go with Sahbi first. No, I mean, of course, as you said, it's. Uh, I feel a bit of pain as well seeing Boss, a coach who Ajax wanted first going to PSV. But if you look at the current squad of PSV, I don't know how Bo Boss would change the type of play with the type of players into his style of football. I, I don't see it uh, happening. I don't think he will... Yeah, I don't think he will do anything this first season. Look at his back line, looking at his midfield. PSV is, is used to playing transition football. Now he's going to play 180 degrees uh, differently, trying to uh, uh, play pressing football. It takes time. It's not something that you can develop in, in one or two months, uh, especially if you haven't played that type of football. And you don't have the type of players for it. So he has a huge task. He's taking a huge risk uh, by getting into PSV. But I won't wish him luck. And 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 and, and I don't think he will succeed this first season. That's my, that's my two cents. Yeah, the only thing I would say to that, if the if the um, how do you call it, if the news, the rumors, what we're reading is true. Look, he's on a mission, right? He also said that I think when he was on one of the Dutch shows on Ziggo. His main mission now is he wants to win a prize, you know? So he wants certain guarantees. I think this was already touched upon by Luke as well. When a new coach comes in, I think Boss maybe for the first time he's demanding some stuff and maybe PSV is willing to go with that. So he wants yeah. certain players that can play his style, et cetera, et cetera. But you well, don't believe he, in, uh, Yeah, but then he needs to change a lot. And from what I've heard of Boss is he will, he'll never change the way he plays. So, of course, his mission is to win prizes, but... He, he also mentioned that he would never change his football style. So it's going to be difficult for him. And uh, we'll have to see what, uh, yeah. uh, what will happen. All right. Uh, Kabir. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm finding you. somebody who, like, you know, is a little bit on my side, you know, with the emotional part. Yeah, 100%, bro. <laughs> and right. I think what makes it a little bit uh, more exasperating is the fact that he actually publicly came out and was, like, not begging for the job. But effectively saying, you know, I'm there, I'm open, I'm willing. Like, I'd love to go back. But I don't know the ins and outs. Uh, no. For some reason or the other, it's not an option that we thought was viable. Um, and it's going to be tragic because if he goes there and does well, it's going to feel really bad when, you know, seemingly there was a good choice on the market. But what you, know what's funny, though? you know what's funny though? When when Boss was uh, when Boss left Ajax and went to Dortmund, I believe Sven was there. Yeah. Um, when Sven became sporting director at Stuttgart, he talked to Boss because they were looking for a manager as well. So it's not like Boss is somebody he doesn't know. You know, he he knows him. He talked with him. Uh, he worked with him, although you know for a short amount of time. So it's very. It's very interesting that <clears throat> Boss being available all these months, you know, I know he officially started, Sven officially started May 19th, but still, you know, that he might go to PSV. It's just, um, yeah, strange. But okay, uh, Luke, uh, I want to ask you something, right? So we're talking about Knudsen, of course. This was the main topic. Uh, Boss going probably to PSV. Um, and we also touched a little bit on you know, maybe other coaches, maybe more established coaches, or maybe not. If it was, if it was up to you, and maybe you guys can also comment in the in the comment section uh, for the viewers, but also Sahbi Kabir, your point of view. Who would be your ideal 
maybe realistically a little bit, of course. Don't come with like names that will not come to the air division. Um, who would be your number one pick, like from where you're standing right now? So Pep Guardiola is out the question, is he? Completely. <laughs> <It's> out, yeah, <laughs> well, depends. Maybe if he wins the Champions League, you know, who knows? But no, he always no, said. He always said. Uh, so on on a realistic level, uh, it would either be Bosch or Knudsen. For me, they're both quite similar. Uh, the the thing with with Bosch is that I feel like I feel quite sorry for him in a sense because I feel like no one's really given him that proper chance. I know I actually left because of back staff problems, you know, and the background. Uh, but he goes to Dortmund, and he, and, he, and he I think he didn't concede a goal in his first five games, and then he had injuries that really cost him. Uh, Marco Royce was injured. Um, Pisek, a right back, was injured. And then, and then when he came back, he then had I think a centre back and a left back injured, and he never really, never really sorted himself out for him. He then gets sacked, and and then he ends up in Leon or and by Leverkusen, and he's there for like a year or so, and it's almost like no one really gave him the opportunity to to really bring his players in and really uh, cement his style. Um, at times, it can seem like it's very outdated because he did play with Hullet uh, for the Netherlands and, and things like that. So his ideas are probably more towards total football than the oppositional play which you see in the Premier League with, with Pep. Uh, it's, it's more old school, potentially, uh, if you look at it from a different perspective. But for me, Bosch has, has, has been in France and he's been uh, in Germany and the Netherlands. And it's almost like, um, you know, I've, I've seen an interview where I think it was when he was on Rondo. And I think he said, um, you know, that he's actually learned about changing bits and making better subs and things like that. And obviously he hasn't had another club to prove that at. Um, but for me, I think maybe it's, it's difficult because Canucksen, you get excited by the the kamikaze football, like you said, that he could potentially produce, and you want to know and kind of step into the unknown and know what he can do. But at the same time, if if it doesn't come to fruition, then you're kind of like, well, we should have went with Bosch anyway, and you know what you get with Bosch, right? So it's 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 fifty fifty for me. I think I'd rather go with experience with Bosch, uh, because you've seen him if one season Europe uh, Europa League final. You know, you know what you're getting, don't you? Uh, for me, I, th I think Bosch, but I'd be happy with either or. So, yeah, well, just just one question, right? Between Knutsen and Bosch, who would you say has more tactical structure in the in the team when they play? Knutsen for me. Knutsen for me. Uh, I I don't think I've ever seen uh, Bosch turn around and think, oh, do you know what? Let me tell my left back to stay deeper and and, and defend in a five. He, it reminded me of um, growing up. Uh, watching Arsenal get, uh, dominate the Premier League, Arsene Wenger would always uh, go and just score three goals, but he'd still be trying to get a fourth and a fifth and a sixth in, in 80th minute. And then later on, as as we got to 2008, 9 and 10, 11, Chelsea started dominating and Man United was, and Arsenal would go and they'll be winning 1-0, but still trying to get another one rather than thinking, well, let's just sit back and defend the league. It's different with Arteta now. He knows how to, how to defend, but it was a thing where, you know, I don't think Bosch, maybe it's just a little bit, behind everyone else slightly tactically where I don't think he's willing to sacrifice being able to score another goal to win a game 2 nil rather than defend a 1-0 lead yeah. you know so um, but you know I, they, they both would, uh, will play great football at Ajax I think either or it's not like right. they anyway so clear so, so basically if it becomes Knutson you're happy as well yeah yeah absolutely alright good uh, Sahbi what about you man yeah I mean I, I, I would stick with Gallardo uh, just like uh, one year ago, uh, basically because he has the same profile as Knutso, but um, he still has a bit more because he is also an established coach, um, uh, not only domestically, but also within their Champions League uh, uh, yeah. version, the Copa yeah. Libertadores and so on. Yeah. So he didn't perform um, with River Plate in domestically but also outside of Argentina and that's something that's something what Ajax seeks as well and he's developing youth he's playing attacking football playing dominant football uh, bringing in uh, talents from the academy um, so basically it has the same profile as Ajax and uh, firstly there was a thing that he uh, the, the negative part of uh, of him having a, uh, him as a coach was the language barrier uh, because he couldn't talk English, but from what I've read, is he started to uh, taking courses, uh, English courses, because he wants to come to Europe. And since he doesn't have a club right now, as far as I uh, know, 
I think it will be a great stepping stone uh, to come uh, to Ajax before uh, taking the next step. It's strange though, right? It's strange that somebody so successful like him has been on the market for so long and nobody snapped him yet. Is yeah, yeah he, wanted, he wanted to have a year. Yeah, he, he, he mentioned that he wanted to have a year oh, off. Okay. A sabbatical. Uh -huh. So maybe uh, the market is open for him after the, uh, uh, in, in, in the next season. I don't know. Do you think, do you think it would have been possible for Ajax to maybe sign him realistically? I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know what what his uh, demands are because he was a free agent. I don't know what his salary uh, demands uh, were, but uh, from what I know, Schroeder picked up a nice salary as well uh, from Ajax. So I don't know. Every, anything is possible. Yeah, everything is possible. And actually, he went to earn even more, by the way. But okay. Um, Kabir, what about you? Who's your... Who's your number one pick? Who would you like if it was up to you? If you were Sven, who would you pick? 100% Louis van Gaal. I believe, somebody, I believe somebody in the chat also mentioned uh, van Gaal. Really? Go ahead. Yeah, go well, ahead. You know what? It's a little bit of a joke, but in the sense that actually a type of Louis van Gaal is someone that when I talk about a gamble, when I think of Louis van Gaal, I think it's the opposite. I just think experience, been there, done it, Ajax legend. Uh, you know, he's managed a national team as well. Fine, I understand the football he played with the Netherlands at the World Cup was very anti-football, but I think that was also to do more with the fact that he's in a tournament and he's trying to get a result with very limited personnel. But I think if you look at the glories of Ajax, and actually, you know, you're talking about someone who's overachieved, someone who can bring through the youth, someone who's been there and done it, that type of profile would fit absolutely perfectly. Uh, you know, and I, I yeah. but it, it's unrealistic. I get yeah. it. It's Truce. Truce wouldn't allow it. <laughs> yeah, Truce wouldn't allow it. But you know that kind of person. Um, failing that, obviously, I think the obvious Peter Boss that everyone has spoken about. I think um, you know Juan. I actually uh, definitely understand the sentiment in that particular year when you know there were some games I watched either on television or at the stadium, and it was just electric. The type of football we played. You know, I think that that was our first bit of European success. I know we lost in the final, but, you know, it can still be counted as a bit of European success that we had seen as a club since maybe, uh, you know, 1995, 96, but maybe that year where we got to the quarters, you know, under Ronald Koeman. Yeah. But, you know, like, it, it brought us but, back. But I would only say to that, but just, just, to feel, uh, just to fill you with this one, I think the group that Koeman had compared to Bos, the one from Koeman was much more talented. Oh, it was incredible. It was an yeah. incredible group. Yeah. I mean, from the far, uh, you know, all these guys. I mean, he was a young guy. And then we had all these other talented players. Andy van der Meijer. Uh, was Zlatan Slavo? Kivu, 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 all these. It was a, a quality group, of Zlatan. course. Zlatan. Yeah, you know. Um, I get that. But so but so there is that sentiment with Peter Boss. But then I also remember that when... You know, he was managing us. Me, along with a lot of other Ajax fans, were talking about how this guy doesn't have a plan B. Uh, you know, how he's tactically quite naive. Um, and, you know, how much silverware has he won in his career? I think a grand sum of zero. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But it's still going to be pretty tragic if he goes to, to PSV. Um, so yeah, that would probably be my pick. Maybe a slightly left side, uh, left field with LVG, and a slightly potentially more realistic with Boss, or at least it was realistic up until a few weeks ago. Just not Solskjaer. Uh, Solskjaer, <laughs> I'm not going to be tweeting Solskjaer in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, guys. Um, let me see. Uh, just going to the comments, just a few comments, and then I will come to the last part, which we still have to touch upon. Uh, we were late. I was late, five minutes. So it's only fair to give them an additional five, six minutes. Right, guys? Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. All right. So um, Rolls or Conte is saying, I don't agree. Uh, he really wanted to work at Ajax at uh, many points in recent past. He went to war with Kraft even for it. Think he would be a good CEO. He's reacting about to... Louis Fajal. About Louis Fajal. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Safi. Um, Roy is not a fan. Um, always outspoken, Roy. Thank you. Well, his name wasn't Kamikaze Boss for nothing. All right. Um, 
I just, yeah, <laughs> silverware wise boss would be the best fit for Tottenham. <laughs> Always yeah. finding a way to, I mean, we'll never get any Tottenham fan on this channel, man. Seriously. Oh, um, man. Um, by the way, big up to Zlatan, of course, um, retiring from football. Um, I had to think about it. Like, you know, I was thinking back about his, uh, you know, when he was at Ajax. I still remember, I still remember like everybody here. I don't know if everybody know, was at that time watching Ajax, but what really stuck with me still was like, it took him like a year or so at least to show like how good he was at Ajax. And everybody was saying like, you know, he was so good uh, during the training and he did the most miraculous stuff, but you wouldn't see it. The only thing you would see, like he was very, um, how do you say it? Like, Aggression, aggression wise he always like had elbows and these kind of things and, and funny enough actually the first person that told me about his skills how good he was that saw glimpses was Papimento. i remember Papimento telling me like especially when we played in europe we kind of played with um kuman quite deep because we weren't that we were young and we were like being pressed deep and the only way out of that was sending long balls to Zlatan, and he would keep like the ball with him with two defenders at his back, yeah. only being how old, 19 or something at, yeah. at that time. So that was yeah. for me like, oh, wait, wait, he's he has. I still he has remember, him. I still remember the game against Valencia. We yeah. were pressured the whole game, and then there was one action, a solo action from Zlatan where he, where he made that goal. Wow, man, unbelievable. Yeah. Puppy it's nose funny. ball, puppy it's nose ball. When when they when he was at Ajax, everyone at the club thought Mido would have a much better career. Exactly, I remember yeah. that. They they sort of it, it's almost like that classic thing where Henri Trezeguet and Anelka, when the three of them were growing up, they thought Henri would have the worst career out of the three of them. Yeah, um, and look how it works out. That's, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. So uh, quickly on one question for you guys before we go to the other point with preseason happening soon, guys. Do you think? Uh, we will get a coach at least a week before the date. Yeah, because there was a, uh, a uh, the the preseason will start at the end of the month, so they will start, you know, and then a month later we will go. We will go. I'm not going, but Ajax will go to Germany, <laughs> um, and we're playing playoffs, you know. So the yeah, I mean, a lot of things should be already prepared, scheduled, you know, and the coach has yeah. a big say in that. So it's a good point. What do you guys think uh, in terms of time, timing, and stuff? I expect uh, I expect some news very soon. Soon this week or soon next week? Well, no, not this week, but uh, within uh, within uh, the end of next week. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it also has to do maybe if Knudsen is the candidate? I was looking at their fixtures. Um, they do have games uh, because they're in the middle of the season. But exactly, I saw yeah. that they have a game on Sunday, and then after that, if I'm not mistaken, they have like some days off. Uh, so maybe they're waiting for the right time. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. most likely. I mean, yeah. he's their head. I mean, he's in pole position, and uh, we don't hear a lot of news, a lot of rumors. So that's a good thing, uh, by the way. Not any inside information to the tabloid uh, uh, Telegraph. So. Okay. Uh, okay. You already built the bridge. You can yeah, start talking yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, did, I did. Let's go. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on, Sabi. So look, uh, just just a quick intro on that one. Um, it's very apparent and clear, especially for the ones um, living in the Netherlands. Uh, a, lot, a lot of pundits, um, old football players, also, well, I would say recommendable uh, club watchers, um, are quite critical about what's happening right now at Ajax. So it's not even only about Knudsen, but the way that uh, Ajax has been like going through uh, a radical change. You know, a lot of, like, if you look at, uh, past few years we had Overmars, we had Van Sar, we had a lot of people like also Danny Blint was in the supervisory board. You know, all people that were like club legends. And now it's almost like everybody left. Everybody with a like Luke said, Ajax DNA. You know, this is something you hear also the Dutch pundits saying a lot. Where is the Ajax DNA? Ajax is becoming more a business. Uh, the football part, the Ajax football identity is gonna get lost. All these kind of things. So and to top it all off, Telegraaf had a very nice interview with the agent of Heitinga, and uh, he was not happy. He was not amused. And he said that the way that Heitinga was treated, also somebody from the club, of course, from Ajax, um, is actually disgusting, if I can use that word. 
you guys read the articles, you guys hear everything. What do you guys feel about this whole media campaign? I'm going to call it a campaign right now. Uh, let me give it to you, uh, Luke, uh, first. Uh, for me, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it brings unnecessary attention to the club when they're just trying to, they're trying to sort things out and then they're just piling things on because maybe Heitinger is, it obviously is an Ajax favourite, may, maybe is a media favourite as well and they want to make it look as dramatic as possible when it could have been the easiest, po- like behind the scenes, it might have been Heitinger just saying, yeah, okay, I did my job, no problem. No, no hard feelings that bygones be guy bygones. I'll go, I'll go and do my own thing. You know, he he did what he needed to do for six months. Um, I would have liked it had they did offer him something within the club. But the problem is, is that you've now technically managed the club. You can't then take a step back after taking a step forward. You need to then go and go to another Eredivisie club or or somewhere in Belgium. I don't know, something like that. Um, just and, quickly, and just quickly, look. Apparently, uh, his agent, Heitinger's agent, Robbie also said that there was an agreement in the contract mm. that he will stay as an assistant, even mm. if a new coach would come. So basically Sven came in and he said he doesn't believe in that whole narrative to uh, put him as an assistant. If maybe some other coach comes in, he wants his own staff. So it, sound, it sounds very logic what Sven is saying. And Sven wasn't around when that agreement was made with Heitinga. So how do you feel about that? It sounds like it's uh, Van der Sar just trying to give one more middle finger before he before he goes on holiday for four well, years. Well, at that time he didn't know that he was leaving, right? So no, this exactly. Was, was, yeah. But um, for me, obviously, I, I don't agree with saying you're going to do one thing and then not do another. Sven's coming to do a job and change things. He's obviously been left with it. So, um, and also, I do believe that a manager needs his own staff. Otherwise, you end up with a situation with Bosch again. You know, whoever, if Heidegger doesn't agree with something that the new manager did, you know, they will clash heads. While someone would leave, it would just be big unrest. Like we've had not had a great season with psychological uh, issues and mentality going to big games. It would just be the whole issue all over again. So it's better just to start from scratch, in my opinion. Um, but I also um, I don't like the way that they've just kind of said one thing and then done another. Do you know, like Heising has come in a difficult time, difficult situation. You know, he's not had the best time with the with, with the young Ajax, but. Um, He's done what he could, like we say, and maybe he didn't implement his own thing because he was only given, he knew he only had six months, essentially, maybe, and then he'll, they'll talk into the season. But he did what he could, and, I mean, he won more games, I think, than I expected uh, with the team he had and did better than Schroeder did in in, in the rest of the season. So um, it, it, it's a difficult thing, isn't it, that you kind of balance, like I said, it's business and then it's and then it's loyalty and, and the DNA. And it's like Sabi said, I, I, I believe you... Agree, agree, and still need one person that knows or two people that knows football within the club. It's just go about things with a bit more class, I think, a bit more respect for the people that have been there before. Um, but how how old are these people? That this this agent of his, the old one that was complaining, so he must be stuck in, you know, in in 1974 or something after they just won the champ the European Cup for the last for the third time, still wondering about they need five, six, seven, eight Ajax players. Um... There well, he's yeah. actually a quite quite a renowned uh, agent, a Dutch agent, uh, and he uh, also manages a lot of Dutch players as well. But you know, of course, he's he's trying to defend Heitinga, mm-hmm. um, and but he also said, apart from Heitinga, he also lashes a little bit at Ajax for the fact that you know um, the Ajax DNA again. You know, all these changes, it's all people coming in with no Ajax identity. So th- he's making that argument a little bit as well. Um, let me give it to Kabir. Kabir, how do you look at all these, uh, again, the media campaign, which has started even before we even have formally appointed a coach? Yeah, I think the Telegraph, the Telegraph, they're renowned for that. They like to create, um, you know, um, well, they like to create a scenario where it's uncomfortable for the club, um, you know, really wreak havoc. Um, I guess they feel like it's their job. Um, but like, you know, I, I, it's not helping the club obviously, but I don't think that's in their interests. Um, they just want to sell papers. They want to sell the story. Um, I think with Heitinger's agent saying what he did, I think that's just a simple case of him being pretty aggrieved with the fact that his client has been sacked effectively or, or let go. Um, but yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, I agree with the fact that if you've managed the first team it completely skews the dynamic that you then go and become assistant. 
It just doesn't work. I understand it was an agreement in place, but it doesn't work. It's not healthy. And I think, you know, um, you need to go in with a clean slate moving forward again. You know, you want to try and minimize all the risks. You want to try and start fresh because whatever happened didn't work, right? Uh, even under Heitinger, it didn't work. I don't think we won a single game against a big club. Yeah, but, uh, but, but wait, just, just one minute, right? So we have a viewer here who's very uh, vocal about this, Keith. Um, Ajax DNA weighs more for me than anything about football results. If not Ajax DNA, I will stop supporting Ajax. Ajax is more about the DNA. No glory hunter, no cash. Uh, Ajax against modern football. Some fans, there are some fans out there that for them, they identify themselves with the philosophy of Ajax being that club that has all players that um, brings out, you know, the, the way we want to play. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter when. We always do what we do. We don't go with what's going on around us, you know, with other, other teams, etc. So if we appoint Knudsen, right, we already have Sven. Um, okay, we have Van Hals in the, in the supervisory board. But in general, are, and we don't know who the CEO will be, you know, aren't we stepping away too much from that? That's mainly the question right now. Apart from whether it will bring us results, yes or no. My my argument to that is that football is a results based industry. Okay. It's as simple as that. Why do we? Why do the footballers train? Why do we? Why do the footballers try and attempt to put the ball in the back of the net to win a game of football? Right. <clears throat> uh, if it was just about, of course, you want it to be with the Ajax style of play. Absolutely, I would hate it yeah. if we played Group One or if we played like Mourinho. For sure not. But the fact of the matter is, is that at this point in time, if you can get the best people that you feel can do the job and get the results on the pitch, I feel like that's something that the club needs more at this stage versus, you know, someone bringing someone... Because, look, Heitinger, of course, if Heitinger had done well in his spell, I would have been all for Heitinger to continue managing the first team. But he didn't do well. Yeah, so last we week, last week, just quickly, last week yeah. uh, we had Gushwin, Mark Gushwin, on the channel. And he said, like, you know, it's always nice from, from outside uh, listening to, you know, how... Uh, we always make a problem or we always try to think like, yeah, it has to be a Dutch coach. It has to be the next in half and all these kind of things. But for him, personally for him, he doesn't want to step away from youth. For him, that's like what, what, what makes Ajax. If a coach comes in from outside like Knudsen and he implements, you know, his system, attacking football, attractive football, and he also has an eye on the youth and develops them, like staying truth to the academy, staying truth to the Ajax philosophy in that regard, for him, that's enough. Of course, with the results also. But I, I don't I realistically agree. think that Ajax would hire a manager and that manager would all of a sudden be like, I'm not going to look at the youth academy. I don't think that's ever going to be the case. No, exactly. You know, come on, there has to be a sense, you know. The, the, well, well, wait, wait, wait. Uh, do you remember the Yule era? What kind of players we were bringing in? Yeah, all of course. Agents, yeah, all but that's, agents, all yeah, agents, yeah. And we're no, but that started the revolution, eh? That yeah, but yeah, but you're saying no. But the way the reason why I'm reacting is you you said I don't think ever it happened. No, no, I'm saying that happened, and that was a period in history, and then yeah. the revolution took place, and I don't think we'd ever go back to those dark times where someone like Hyun Jung Sok got a contract because he was hanging outside the training ground watching them playing and saying hi hi, can you give me a a, a trial? He got a trial and he got a contract. <laughs> that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's like village. That's like you know like. Fourth division, fifth division. No, we've moved on from that. But I don't think now in this day and age that we would ever sign a manager that wouldn't look at the youth team. I mean, the, you know, the, but that yeah. doesn't mean that it has to be an Ajax manager with Ajax, uh, you know, that has played for the club. I don't think no, so. Exactly. I think it's, it's, it's quite, it is difficult. It is difficult because it's about how you perceive it, isn't it? You look at, do you perceive Ajax as, you know, uh, everything has to be Ajax history. Everything's got to oh, sit in it, sit in the past, and have X, Y, Z, uh, Van der Sar, Van Hal all sitting in the board, and, and they all make decisions. Because if Danny Blind came in again, okay, who who, who thinks he's going to do this to, a good job this time round, or a better job than before, or you know, do anything differently? Sometimes you need a fresh face in, but you can still be Ajax with your academy and still have, uh, you know, your um, Van der Bates coming through, etc. Um, but while still having things different and working behind the scenes because they're two separate 
contingencies, aren't they? That one's business and one's financial and, and, and making Ajax a bigger club and being able to compete in the Champions League or in, in Europe, because unfortunately the Premier League is getting all the money and they're buying everyone. Yeah. So Ajax have to compete just like Portugal. Yeah. Just like just like France soon, PSG are the only team, and just like Germany, Bayern, really that can really hold on and take everyone's players, right? So Ajax have to keep running with their academy and that's their way of making money by selling Kudus to the Premier League for 60 to 80 million and then reinvesting it in a cushion sale for 12, like, or, or however much it cost, um, just so they can, you know, reinvest and, and run. So like like uh, Kabir said, it, it, the academy will never go away. It's just people being able to accept the fact that times move on football is modern and it always changes and it's always quick and you have to adapt or you get overtaken unfortunately isn't it i agree 100 so, yeah absolutely um sabi anything you want to add to what we just discussed he discussed a lot guys <laughs> so where to start we discussed a lot no i mean on the on the fact that what we, we <laughs> the Alex dna stepping away from it having spent and probably like a german like no disrespect but having a german director of football, having a Norwegian coach, you know, these kind of things, the whole narrative that's happening right now. How do you feel about that? No, I'm, I'm all in for capable people who follows the IX DNA. So there's mm -hmm. not, there should not be somebody, there should not be a, a, a rule uh, set in stone that that specific player individual should have a past at Ajax. In my view, we we fell, we fell a lot. So we need to take one step back, put in capable people and in order to uh, move two steps further. Later on, there are always Ajax, former Ajax players who can step in. I mean, we're already waiting for a CEO who will most likely uh, be someone with an Ajax DNA uh, who can guard the, 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 the culture of Ajax. And from there on, there, there will be multiple... Uh, former players who can step in. They were yeah, talking the only in the thing, past the only about thing, Quickly on that, there is a footnote there because um, we have until August 1 to find a new CEO. Otherwise, Menocheda will probably Menocheda step Menocheda in. Would in the meantime. Yeah, he can act as an interim. Yeah. So, and I don't want to, like, personally, I don't want to be in that situation because. You know, like we had interim scenarios already from last year. Yeah, yeah. Nobody does. Nobody does, of yeah. course. But I, I may assume that uh, Pierre Erichal will do his utmost to to bring in someone capable. Yeah. It's not an easy task. So it's got to be somebody with who has a bit of experience, has an IX DNA, and so on. So it's difficult to find that specific person, that special person, yeah. uh, to bring in at IX. And with regards to uh, that agent Rob Jansen uh, with his uh, with his uh, article, uh, uh, he's mentioning it's disgusting what happens at Ajax. But I think what he did is disgusting by creating so much chaos uh, internally within Ajax because uh, 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 he had Van der Sar as a client, he had Hatika as a client. So basically, he lost influence within Ajax because those were high-profile functions within Ajax. Imagine having a CEO, uh, being an agent of a CEO, whispering things in, in, in the ears of, of Van der Sar. The same applies for Hadnicha. He loses all of that. So what he did is he's partnering with the Telegraph because the Telegraph also doesn't have any inside information anymore since uh, Schroeder left and so on and so on. So they're having a tactical partnership trying to attack uh, the club. Which so is wait a minute. Good. Are you seeing our club watchers... Are not objective? Are you seeing that right now? I'm saying that. I'm saying this is being recorded. Sarcasm. I'm saying that. sarcasm. Sarcasm. Come on, man. <laughs> the, All right. Um, yeah. Do you just... hear the podcast or talking about uh, Muslim thought and so on? It's it's an attack. If you attack Muslim thought, you're attacking Ajax because Muslim thought is acting on behalf of Ajax. He is there for the interest of Ajax. So if you're attacking him, you're attacking Ajax. If you're attacking Ajax, you're attacking me. So I mean, and all the fans. So basically, this is this is this is bullshit. This is disgusting from their side, and this this needs to stop. Period. Yeah, yeah understood, um, guys. Uh, I think we uh, we covered everything. Unless Kabir, Luke, anything, last comments, something you want to say, you want to leave it to the viewers. 
No last no. question for your side. For your side. No last questions. I saw. I. I just trying to be funny again. <laughs> trying to be funny again. Um, there's no last question this time, guys. That's it. Uh, I felt guilty for the five six minutes. I thank you guys. We went even to 20 minutes over, so it's all good. Um, so people are having a laugh with the players that were that were signed by uh, by y'all in the chat. I'm happy. They're happy. Um, yeah, it was, Atuba, that was a good one. Huh? Timothy Atuba. Atuba was Atuba, a yeah. very good one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just want to say thank you to all of you. Luke, I hope you enjoyed the first one. Can we have I you did. again? Yeah, absolutely. You can even put me in your little banner and have five people in the banner soon, yeah? <laughs> no, that, no, that's fine. That's fine. And look, you can tell me offline if you don't want to be with Kabir or you don't want to be with Sahbi next time. I totally understand. So no, Kabir, uh, Kabir agreed with me. So that'd be as in publicly. Yeah. So I think I like Kabir more at the moment. Yeah? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, guys, thank you so much, um, everyone. Also, the viewers. I hope you guys enjoyed the three parts of Sven Misenthal, by the way, that we published on YouTube. Yeah. Um, for me, it was really very uh, informative. I, I learned a lot from from those uh, from talking to the fans. Um, I saw somebody commenting, by the way, on the last one that we had, that uh, it would be nice to have also some kind of talk with somebody knowledgeable about uh, Knutsen. We will try. If he becomes a coach, we will do our utmost to find somebody uh, to get and explain us a little bit more and more giving more background on what kind of coach he is. Uh, for now. Enjoy the summer, guys. Enjoy the hot temperatures. Um, and we'll see you next week. Take care, guys. guys. Peace.